Cool. All right. It should be starting soon. So let's give a few seconds. In the meantime, I know this is a dynamic analysis challenge, but I'll probably I'll probably try to do as much dynamic as possible. It's definitely going to be, oh, look, there's a calculator that popped up. I'll definitely try to do as much dynamic as possible, but I'm mostly, um, I've mostly focused on static. So I guess in that, in that sense, um, it's definitely going to be a challenge. So let's see, something popped up. I want to maybe look at the processes to see if there's anything that stands out. Maybe the malware author wrote something and just named it, I don't know, bad.exe or something. Hopefully they did. If not, then I'll try other methods. It's overwhelming, but I'll try to see if there's anything that stands out. It's not a big deal if it's not. And Hey, Willis, I kind of missed the setup for this. So there was just an executable that you started um, that, you know, presumably you just got from, you know, I don't know, somebody accidentally sent it to you or whatever. Is that right? Yeah, I got two VMs from a sketchy coworker at Blue Halo. <laughs> one of the VMs is a Kali box that is supposedly attacking this Windows VM. That's as much as I know. Nice. Okay. As you saw... It started a calc process. Um, so, I mean, I see ruby.exe, that's a little suspicious. Then at the same time, it says ruby-lang.org. Might be legit. I don't know the real um, website. But, I mean, there are a lot of names I've, I haven't seen. So, that works. Yeah, that's a good drive. Point. OneDrive is, doesn't appear to be on, but it could be running, the well, con host. I don't know if OneDrive runs that, but we'll see. Did you already shut down Calc? I did, I should have left it on. That, okay. Yeah, that, that would have been a good idea. Okay, interesting. So, I'll start location for those who don't know. One way of starting a program up when you reboot or when you log in is to put in your startup folder. So this is possibly suspicious. This is um, the user folder and start menu programs. It should also show up here. I don't know if it still does. I'm not used to Windows 10. Nope. And another thing popped up. This time I'll leave it running. And oh look, OneDrive.exe now has Notepad.exe running. So there's a good chance that's the sketchy thing. Um, for maybe oh no, I won't close it. I'm not too familiar with a lot of these tools. Like I said, I've mainly focused on static analysis, which is usually disassembling the file, looking at the code and assembly at the assembly level. Dynamic involves running it and watching its behavior. <laughs> Hello, Willis. Awesome. Um, so let's see. Owned. <laughs> Just to verify, let's see. Um, let's check if there's any possible network connections. One thing you can use is TCP view. And that shows you all the connections that the processes are running or connecting to. And I'm looking for anything suspicious, possibly that OneDrive, but I don't see anything yet. I can leave it in the background to see if I'll see it pop up. And one, one Annoying thing, as you prob have probably seen, is that there's a lot of service hosts here. That's pretty normal for Windows, but it can can be annoying when you're doing analysis. And another tool I'd like to try is Auto Run. 
it's that when I mentioned the startup folder, I said that's one of the methods of starting a program when you reboot or log in. This has pretty much all the different methods. So for your registry, schedule tasks, et cetera. Yeah, so Renato says, isn't that OneDrive just the startup for the Microsoft OneDrive? That's possible. I'm not too sure either. So that's something we would try to investigate further, see if OneDrive is doing anything else. If not, then that's probably, like he said, just um, false positive. Yep, and Chen says, does uh, OneDrive live in System 32? And OneDrive wouldn't uh, spawn Notepad. That's true. So that right? that is uh, another red flag for OneDrive. Yeah, a little, little sus there. So current version run, that's a popular registry key where you can um, put uh, paths to your exe in. Let's see. Let's scroll their scheduled tasks. A lot of these look like gibberish to me, honestly. Or not gibberish, but calculator just opened. <laughs> These are all breakdowns too, instead of looking at everything. So, I don't even see this stuff up. Is that where the startup is? I do not see the startup folder. It's here somewhere, but I guess that's one part of his challenge, trying to figure it out. I wrote it, yeah. Ryan. Oh, you're do we have many reverse engineers here? I'm just talking to the ether and maybe someone will spawn. A little bit. Yeah. So we got a suggestion in here, try Procmon and uh, filter OneDrive to see what activities it's doing. That is true. Procmon is another system internals tool that pretty much monitors every change in the system, file rights, registry changes. Uh, I probably said file already, but let's see. I don't use this often, so let's see. Filter, process name possibly. I also probably might have done it wrong too. One drive. Okay. So I think if you if you go back into that window and uncheck everything except that that top one, you should be able to see. <clears throat> uh, what you're looking for. Okay. I, I thought these were filters, but it's worth a try. So while I'm checking all these, I guess I'll tell you all the story about how I became a reverse engineer. So back in the late 80s, before I could even talk, my mom brought me to a salt and pepper concert. That's when they were really big. And Peppa saw me and she's like, hey, I love OneDrive. She's like, hey, what do you want to be when you grow up? I'm like, I want to be a reverse engineer. And she's like, oh man, I used to be one too. But that was way before computers were mainstream. I don't even know if anyone even had it. She's like, yeah, I really like malware, but my favorite is when they're compiled in standard call because you know what they do with arguments? They push it real good. Ah, uh, salt. Oh, nice. 
<laughs> okay, so I lied. That's not how I became a reverse engineer. But no, yeah, that's we're... that's canon now. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I lied. Uh, so yeah, I guess I've always tried to go the extra mile in all my jobs, but my previous employer didn't appreciate it. Turns out the Uber customers didn't like me going the extra mile. Hey -o. Oh, another good suggestion here. Um, if the pop-up pops up again, you could always filter for that API on Procmon. Oh, I actually do not I know how to do that. Is that um like message box or something? Um do 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 probably be event class, right? Am I right, right about that? I don't know. I am not a Windows guy, so I'm I am it has uh, been a while since I've used Procmon. That's good. We're all stumped. If you know this is being attacked by the other device, um, is there some type of beacon activity going out from your device or uh, coming into your VM? Uh, yeah, that's a good question. Um, just real quick, Willis, it's under uh, tools process list. Tools process list. Yeah. Let me. So the problem with that, though, is that like, unless you really know what you're looking for, like if 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 you don't know what the CNC machine is, it's easy for it to hide under the radar, right? Like it's hard to filter for. Um, <laughs> Ken, what'd you say? Hard tools. To uh, yeah, tools. Um, do 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 do. Process start. Oh, okay, maybe but it's it's all right. Since we, in case it deletes itself, let me um, go to that startup photo. I should have done that first. I think in Windows 10, you do shell startup. Uh, give it a copy. Okay, but that's interesting. I don't see it. So it probably doesn't, well, it also probably doesn't all this, well, it's in a startup folder. That doesn't explain why. I'm honestly not sure, but. TCPs. Okay, there's possibly network traffic. Yeah. Jeremy's like, is uh, do you know what the IP address for the uh, Cali box is? I do because I said I. I'll pretend that I don't. Let's see. Um, this probably won't show it. This doesn't guarantee it, but the current box is dot one thirty. See, it's full. It was dot one, so. It, doesn't show it. Let's see if it's in TC. Oh, look, OneDrive is right there. That's just listening, listening for commands. I can always run Wireshark. I might as well do it and let it run a background. Yeah, so somebody's saying that right there in the Procmon output, it looks like it's uh, 129. Oh, yeah. Yeah. For some reason, I thought that was the current box, but yeah. That, and let's see. That's Microsoft probably Edge Win 10. Is that right? Microsoft Edge? That's probably the computer name. Oh, okay. So, how they find this PC properties? Yes, MS 10. So, that's the current host. So, yes, 129 is likely that one. I don't think we have dot one running, so probably won't get anything for that. 
What else do I have? Process monitor. Another tool I was thinking of trying out is I can probably close this now. Discmon. Checks for changes in the on the file system on, the, on disk. Not sure we'll find much just because I would assume that whatever activity was programmed there would already can create a file. Oh, so I don't know what that is. That might have been it trying to extract a driver. Okay. So we won't do that. Um, there's nothing else I can think of in regards to dynamic analysis, so we might have to jump into static. Sorry if that bores some people. It's going to be a lot of assembly. So I'll use Ida. I, I know uh, you have to... <laughs> yes. No, it's okay. Go ahead. So I hear uh, Ghidra uses Slay or something like that. Is that right? Yeah. My family once told me we were going sledding, but we ended up going skiing instead, and I felt misled. Mm, man. No, nah, no. Oh yeah. All right. All right, so I think this might be because I'm using uh, my MacBook, which has a high resolution, so I don't think the scaling really turned out well. So function names are all really small, which shouldn't matter. We're not going to be really looking at them. So, oh yeah, let me try to stop it. I think that was one of the objectives. John, Wait, before you do that, one. before you do yep. that, um, I'm going to give you a hint. Keep running Wireshark. All right. So I will not stop running it. And I'll just stay with Ida for now. What I like to do, first thing when I go to Ada is to look at the strings because they give me a quick overview. Oh, oh that's, that looks too small, <laughs> doesn't it? Okay, hold on, wait. Check Wireshark, you might have stopped it from collecting. I did, whoops. Let me see if I can change the font size. Thanks guys. So, I mean, it's Ida Pro. It's actively hostile to uh, user hey, interaction. How's that look? That's better. Better. Yeah. What are you running in an 8K uh, monitor there? Um, <laughs> whatever that is. 22,000 by uh, 8,000? <laughs> 3,500 by 2,200. Dang. So um, we have a question. What did you open in IDA? Was it the OneDrive.exe? Yes, OneDrive.exe. And is, I, that the, is that the malware file that you got that you ran? So I assumed it was the malware file because... OneDrive, like someone mentioned earlier, doesn't really open notepad.exe. Yeah. And so that gave me a red flag. Another reason was it said that its auto start location was in the startup folder. OneDrive, you can put files in the startup folder to have it start up in the beginning, but something official from Microsoft, they wouldn't do that for you. They would most yeah. likely have it changed in the registry or somewhere else. So when you open so OneDrive, you go to preferences or something. Somebody said that the uh, the version is NA. That, that's, that, that's another good point. Let's see. Properties, file description, file version, product name, yeah. It doesn't have anything. Let's just 
to compare, let's check. I don't think I have Microsoft software, but assuming that's a legit Microsoft Visual Studio. We have Microsoft Corporation, that's on copyright, so that's yeah. more flags. Yeah, nice. And so, yeah, how I got to there was a shortcut for getting to the Windows 10 startup folder is show startup. That brings you there. Another is to just follow you fit what I found in Process Explorer and just go straight there. Let's check Wireshark again. I see connections activity between 129 and 130. I don't understand what that means. It's not plain text. What else is there? I don't see anything else. So going back to Ida for now. Here it appears there's a lot of When I see PCAP, I think of Wireshark Network Capture. I don't think, I guess because it stands for Packet Capture. I don't think OneDrive would have something like that. A lot of these other things are probably just strings, compilation strings from the compiler, API calls. You can skip through a lot of these. Yeah, maybe there's a... Wait a minute. So, Jeremy says Adnan's name was right there. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Hmm. That's that's a little suspicious. It is. Well, Adnan. No, I think this is legit. I think you're. I, you maybe want to look at something else. This is back uh, during his time at Microsoft when he was working on OneDrive. Ah, okay. Scroll back up near the top. Near the top, as in the top. Yeah. Failed to schedule the chore. Keep going. <laughs> a little suspicious. I think I'm at the top. Starting sensor. <laughs> Seconds. All right. Mm. Connecting to shell code transport. I completely glanced over it. I blame the wow. font. But... Nice. Ooh, shell code. <laughs> It's gonna be tough. Uh, I don't know if there's any, I'm not aware of any sys internals tools that might be able to help. There probably are, but I'm not so sure. Just, here, but I can go to. Just, just double click on the XREF. Yeah. yeah, there you go. So double clicking it brings you to where the string is stored. You press X for IDA, and IDA to find the cross reference. And it seems like this function or this line in the function references this string so i'll just double click that and go there so shell code received preparing to so that means it's probably receiving shell code from dot 129 executing shell code in a separate thread it might possibly be notepad and calculator i'm not debugging this so i won't be able to get the shell code from Ida. Let's see if there's anything else. Actually, you can pull it out of uh, of Wireshark if it goes through. I can't remember how to do that, but it's it is very doable. All right, let's make some mistakes. So let's see. That was time. Well, I'll go to the bottom because calculator just popped up. So. I will assume that's probably
possibly the shell code. Not too sure. I can copy it out. I think you can actually save it as a raw right. raw byte uh, or yep. that raw blob. Yep. Raw blob blob blog. Yes, <laughs> that's the one. <laughs> Oh, I'm sorry. I'm not. I haven't been keeping up with chat. Let me look here. Um, I don't know if we put in any text editors or hex editors. So yeah, if, it's, if it's transmitting shell code from the reverse shell, then it makes sense. The PCAP is junk. We need to disassemble that separately in IDA. And do you think that there's any way? Um, to uh, use a debugger here, attach that to the uh, process? Well, let's look for a drive. I was so happy I found OneDrive, but not to think, for show. Sure. I think that's it. That's a challenge for a reason. Oh, did I pass it? I think so. Scrolling is not doing too well. It's, yeah, there it is. Yeah. Okay, so maybe I'll go to that string. I can find it. What is that? I don't have it. I guess I'll just scroll for that string. There. Show code received. So what I'm trying to do is theoretically the shell code, well, depending on how you program it, the shell code would probably be received before or right after. I'm going to assume right before this string shell code received, print execute. So I'm going to set a breakpoint here just in case. So you may want to, uh, yeah, you may want to set that breakpoint and get it going again. Otherwise, it might uh, brick the communication to the Kali box, right? All right. So I press play. It's probably on a timer or sleeping for a bit, so it may not hit this break point for a while. Aha. Time for libation. <laughs> oh, so during setup, you guys said the cursor was a little large. How does it look right now? I mean, I'm used to it now. It's four times the size of my my. <laughs> computer. In Wireshark, you can pick a specific packet and filter on it, and you can get the periodicity of the, um, or sort uh, by, and you'll get the periodicity of the exchange if it's okay. unique. If you can find the unique part of it. And also, I guess scrolling through it, you kind of see that all this TCP activity happens. Periodically, so I guess we try to do some math. 230 minus 62, it's like 160-ish. I see one UDP packet. That sounds mm. like a hint. <laughs> I'll continue to do some math for now. 435 and, all right, never mind. Hey, there's another UDP packet. Or is right. that the same one? No, Let's enough. check out this UDP packet. I don't think that. Uh, I don't think that's shell code. But then John hinted at it, so I don't know. I don't think it is either. Okay, 
let's see. Let's better do not stop. Here. I was I was curious because there's several iterations of this, and I wasn't sure. I'm not sure which version is being used. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to dive down a rabbit hole. Let me just quickly kiss kids' belts. Nice doing this on a MacBook. Is that a break that you hit already? No. Oh, there it is. Hey. Cool. So, Shelf for Z, preparing to execute. Let's go and it might not be this. Let me see if. So, one thing I'm looking for is. I wish I had the script that highlighted calls. API calls that might possibly execute the shell code. This might not be much. Virtual alloc is used to create a new memory and. Yeah. Virtual alloc might possibly execute it, but might just be another red bull. Oh, executing shell for a separate thread. Okay, so maybe I was a little off saying preparing to execute. It's probably preparing after this point, since this says executing shell code a separate thread. This, since they're right after the strings, I can presume or assume it to be a print function. So I'll just label that for now. So that's probably not this one here. Considering how there's ID equals and print, good chance it's one of these two strings. Or functions. We can thread. I've never seen that, but that's suspicious. <laughs> and just to check this, it doesn't look like any calls that are. I'll just jump into this just in case. More memory stuff. So it doesn't seem like this is the one that. It could be, but it doesn't seem like it's the one that calls the shell or executes the shell code. So I'll jump in here. So where is the receive or receive from reading info into? Sorry, Mr. Say that again. Um, where's the receive reading into? That's another good point. Oh, how do I do that? Okay, uh, receive. That, that's a good point. So, if there's a receive, which save it somewhere else. Show code received. So possibly this function. So I'll go in here, look for a possible receive call. I'm clicking calls because this will cause the rest to be highlighted. So that will stand out much better. Possibly that one, that's the one left. So here. Oh, and one thing about these, this is a C++ thing. I assume John wrote it in C++. The reason they have this is C++ allows, what is it, operator overloading. So you can have new, for example, with many different options for arguments. And so they kind of make these gibberish things. So Ida lets you demangle the names. And you'll see. It's operator new now. Cool. So this might be a function I should go in. Another one, I can't really go into these because they're addresses. So, Someone says if WS232 or when INET is being imported, then you can just follow oh. the cross reference from the import address yes. table. That's a good point. See that? Oh, I like this. 
it's different from working on your own. Normally, I would check the imports as well, but it's it's really different working in front of people and Isn't it? the workers <laughs> named Adnan that are in this file. Oh look. So like the strings, you just double click it, go to it, and find a cross references. These are both the same. So I don't know why I'm setting a breakpoint here, but I like doing it just as a bookmark as well. Um, in that case, let's let me clear all my book book breakpoints and run it again. So, yeah, that is debugger present. Uh, that's that's in a lot of like CRT startup code, at least on Windows. Um, I'm just saying that now, so you don't have to don't have to go down that rabbit hole. There's no anti debugger stuff going on here. <laughs> yep. And even if there was, I mean, that's just a flag in the in the uh, process execution block. You, you can just change it to zero. <laughs> and is debugger present always returns false. So. <laughs> So while we wait, here's this awesome koozie you got. I don't know if you can see it. This is I drink because your password is password. <laughs> got it from a random nice. conference. I guess while we free, I'll just look around. I don't expect it for anything new. One thing I'm glad about this is John or Adnan are not actually actively attacking my VM. I think I'll feel a whole lot more stressed out if they were. So it's not there. So I just thought of another thing. What do you call a mouse that swears? A cursor. I thought about it while you guys uh, Hey, yo. They're, they're not originals. I got a calendar, a daily calendar of dad jokes. So. I think we're going to take 60 seconds off your clock for everyone you tell now. <laughs> um, what else can I do? I'll go through this internal and see if there's other tools that might look interesting out. Okay, I hold guess. on. I, I, I got some stuff. I, I've been falling down on the job here. Um, what I, which one do we do, 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 do? Okay, so someone would said they would use a filter on Wireshark. IP dot adder is equal to uh, da, 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 129, so you can see just that. That's a good point. Um, so that might help. And Jeremy says, what was that last thing in Wireshark with protocol browser? I honestly have no idea. Uh, browser is Windows junk usually. Okay. And Ryan says, more jokes, please. More jokes. There used to be a really good vulnerability you could just pop. Windows boxes by um, redirecting their traffic by announcing that you are a uh, redirector or whatever, and then anybody that with that browser protocol running would then feed all their traffic through you. Nice. Nice. You broadcast nice. the domain controller, and then everyone would send you their credentials right over the network. Great. Yeah. All right. So we hit the receive breakpoint. And these right here are the arguments that go into receive. You can look at MSDN, but Ida conveniently comments for you. This is the buffer. So actually, I want at this point I have not called receive yet. So I want to wait until it's called before I look in here, RDX. 
So I'll go into this hex view and go to RDX, which is right here in the middle, and do one step. I'm afraid of doing this on my taskbar, or what is it called? Touch bar. Eight. All right, awesome. So, oh, one thing I forgot to check is the length. Hopefully it's still unchanged. R A D. So R A D is I have to so normally let's see R A X is sixty four bit EAX is half of that. Hold on, you're looking at RIP, aren't you? Yeah, there you go. EAX is that. Uh, what is it? High and low? Yeah, we we got a good comment here um, from Emma. Doesn't receive return the number of bytes read? So look in RAX. I'm glad I have these people. Yeah. All right, RX. It hasn't it hasn't been called yet, though. It has. I'm right here after the call. Oh, you are. Okay. Okay. Yep. So it'd be nice if I had MSDN up. That would have been something they pointed out. So RX or receive or receive number return the number of bytes received. So in this case, it's four. Forty four six three B F B. Not sure what that means. Let's see. If there's anything else. I don't want to do that. All right, I messed it up. So control enter to go back. I want to go out of this function. Oh, someone asked uh, what the end goal of this event is anyways. It's really just me talking and trying to find as much as I can. Yeah. 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 <laughs> While it's, other people are drinking. It's, uh, yeah, it's, there's, there's no, uh, uh, one set goal. Like there isn't a flag necessarily, but what, what he's supposed to do is basically try to figure out the command and control and exactly how this is working. And there's usually a twist, a little trick. This one right yeah. <laughs> so, so what I just while um, Mike was going over that, I named this receive, and I wanted to go out into the parent function to see what calls this, and it turns out it's called in three different locations. So that would explain why I got four bytes. That's that's probably not shell code. So I'll I'll run it again. Up oh, and it got there. Let me set the new breakpoint to this. And I have the source seems... code open, so <laughs> I'm following along with you because I don't remember what I did. Okay, I made a mistake. I forgot to go to RDX. Uh, let's see. Can I backtrack? I do not know. Uh, let's play again. Okay, awesome. Did I not set up a I did. Okay. So this time I'm at the call. I can go to RDX. And then I'll step one. Okay, it says 13C. And I start it there. So one DC from there, it's probably two DC. So I will assume this is the shell code given its length. It's a lot better than four. So I'll copy up until two DC. Huh. Jack sword. Yep, I somebody's cannot. saying that FC 4881 is X64 shell code. 
probably Meterpreter or Cobalt Strike. Oh, nice. What I say? One Priest. One. One Priest. There was part of the awesome. message. So two three Cs we want to stop. Someone too far. Yeah, Ello Willis. Did someone decode something? Two three C. Oh, there it is. <laughs> yep. So I will. No, oh, that's the wrong command. I'll just right click. Uh, command C. Can we export? Oh, save the file. I'll assume this is a message box. And 3C. F E D C. So A0 is where it should stop. A0. I do not have a hex editor, so we'll just ignore the remaining bytes. So what I think you can do, if you're trying to disassemble this, right? I think if you yep. can actually jump to that address uh, and like pretend that it's code. That is, yes. I think I think you can do that. Let's try it out. Where am I? Uh, one one is this one zero zero. Oh, just in the um. Oh, so let me undo that. Sorry, what was that Mike? Oh, I was I was going to catch up on some of the uh, messages here. So you could modify EIP um, if you can do that in IDA's debugger, right? I can. Yeah. So, so you could go right to that address and and see what it does. So right now it looks like just random bytes in memory. I press C to convert to code. Ah, perfect. It looks a little good. I don't like shell code, um, but this is a challenge. So I'll set EIP here. It'll crash. I don't have my, <laughs> huh? It will crash. Oh, that's, it'll not, crash. that's not executable memory. It's not, oh, okay. So let's see if I can do that. Let's go to segments, I believe. Debug 71 is where I was, Debug 71. And I wonder if I can change it to execute. Hey, look at that. I wonder if I'll fix it, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I almost pressed F9. Uh, it, it. Uh. Oh. What I could have done is probably set the breakpoint there and just run to it. That maybe I could have followed it into that thread call. Uh, I guess I can run it again. It's still idle. So to answer your question, if it's not executable, how does it run? This is just the 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 sockets buffer where the shellcode has been received. So it's it's just a regular memory buffer. It hasn't been uh, copied to anywhere where the, the protections can be set to actually make okay. the memory executable. So John, I'm, I'm essentially thinking that uh, this is using some sort of process injection then? Or is it um, simpler I than was, that? It's simpler than that. I was okay. going to try to do that, but... Uh, I'd That'd be a deeper hole. Yeah, exactly. So we have five minutes left. Do you think I was thinking of maybe trying to jump to that point? Do you think it's worth it, or should I go somewhere else? Yeah, let's take a poll. Um, Since we're at about sixty, what do you think, John? Like, can you give any hints that'll get him closer to the um, 
the twist, the M. Night Shyamalan uh, <laughs> reveal. <laughs> well, so if we're going for the command and control, if that, because I, someone mentioned that before, and I think that's originally what we were going to go with. Um, there is that UDP packet. Um, the data that's in there controls pretty much everything that happens after that. Okay. Um, and if you want to see where the code is being put into a buffer and then made executable, um, look for a call to virtual protect. Ah. Uh. Yeah, and then you were actually in one of the functions that starts the shell code in uh, one of the, the begin thread EX, uh, uh, one of the functions that calls begin thread. Yeah, I was thinking of following that previous receive oh. and seeing. Emma, I am really sorry. I uh, am falling down on the job here. I didn't see your post. So she said, yes, look for virtual alloc and virtual protect to copy it in. There was only one call to virtual protect, so that's, I'll just bookmark that. Do you want me to tell you the actual name of that function? We can do that. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's not a big deal, but. <laughs> Oh man, <laughs> was this in a a class or something? <laughs> oh yeah, oh yes, hundred <laughs> percent. Okay, yeah, that's another problem with these type of malware. Sometimes you that's, can't go backwards. That's also part of the reason I didn't try to like obfuscate anything, because C plus plus already does a good enough job of that. Yeah. <laughs> So that's probably why there were some functions that I saw earlier that were addressed that called addresses or offsets. It's probably an offset to the beginning of this um, class or struct. So, all right, I failed too. This was that's a fun fine. challenge. I think I'll probably look at this a lot more afterwards. I was thinking initially of maybe hibernating it so I get a, um, so yeah, I, I should have mentioned this earlier. One, I was thinking of probably trying some forensics where I hibernated this system. It would create a hyperfill.sys file, which is compressed memory and run some tools like volatility against it to see if I could find anything. Hmm. But I, might, I might try this afterwards. So. Job well done, so John. Yep. That, uh, I'll just I'll tell you as much as I can. That UDP packet, the first four bytes of that are a magic number, I think. I'm trying to remember. Um, but it looks for that. It sends that. It's um, it has it has uh, NP cap, so it's it's in monitor mode. It's listening for everything. Um, mm -hmm. Explain. Looks for these first four magic bytes and then the length of, or no, then the port to start listening on for shellcode. Okay, nice. And then um, when it starts listening for shellcode, the first thing that it checks, that first four bytes, that is the same magic number. So it makes sure that it's getting, you know, sort of like a data integrity check of some sort. But well, then the rest of it is just, uh, um, for UDP, it counts the number of segments because you can't really like, there's no real flow control. So it's, uh, it's, uh, it does a little bit of its own. Um, but I think this is being transferred through TCP. So yeah, it's just the total length of the shell code and then the shell code. Awesome. Now, if this was doing TCP, TCP one sends from a completely made up IP address um, and all the, the headers are randomized and everything. It's a completely invalid packet. It's extremely obvious that it shouldn't be there, but it still has the same information. 
So I guess a question from me for all the Wireshark um, experts out there, is there any way to correlate data from a UDP packet to a TCP packet? Like, like automatically look for that um, magic number that's gonna go across protocols? Or does that require special foo? Ah, yeah, Jared, so thank you. Frame.contains, nice. Rain dot contains. Is that all I need? Probably not. Yeah, well, it'll probably only isolate. Um, you'll say have to say frame dot contains, and then what would that be? I, I'm bad with uh, Wireshark syntax. Equals and then a hex string. Uh, there's a better find function that you can just put in, and then you can. Um, filter whether you want to try and look at the frame, whether you want to look at the packet, or whether you want to look at um, the data section. Right. And like Renato said, you still have to figure out the magic number. So, and if that changes per command and control message, then you're really only isolating one message at a time. Yeah, so that's that would be really complicated to automate. But it's always the same size. All the ports are always in the same location. The structure is always the same, basically. It's it's just that those values change every time. So you'd have you would have to know what you're looking for. Um, so the other thing you could look for in memory, uh, any read, write, execute pages. I really didn't want to do it that way, but uh, a lot of the 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 payloads that are generated with MSF Venom using uh, like especially some of the stuff that's encoded with uh, Shikata Ganai using x87 instructions uh to uh do the equivalent of like a call pop the some of the uh was it fn stenv instruction that actually writes to the stack so <laughs> um had to make had to make the 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 buffers writable and executable well i don't know the math but... 3191 or the 40, 40, 43, 946. You said the port was one of these? Are you looking at, is this both the UDP and the ICMP reply saying that the port doesn't exist or isn't open? Port unreachable, okay. So the all the information is just in that, that the send one. It, does, it, it doesn't care about the ICMP response at all. So let's see. Uh, where was it? Okay, so yeah, activation header. Uh, first, the first two bytes are the timestamp. The second two bytes are the port. So I was wrong, sorry. Um, said, Jeremy said C77. Yeah, right. Oh, yeah. So that's the port. Yeah. And then the next four bytes after that, that's the magic number. And then the next bit is uh, TCP flag. So, you know, one if it was TCP, uh, zero if it was going to be. UDP. Um, then the bit after that is, should I listen or should I call back? And then the bit after that is, is this going to be IPv6? And then that's it. Nice. All righty. Awesome. Well, I think you got really challenge. far. Yeah. Yeah. A little scary doing it live. I, I didn't do a lot of better stuff than I would. would. <laughs> yeah. All right. Let me stop sharing, and I'll hand it back to Kristen. That is right. Yes, Willis.
thank you so much. Also want to thank Adnan and John for creating this event. Um, they've spent a lot of time writing this novel malware and testing it. And also the captain. Um, and I see Ken Sanderson joined us tonight. Um, he was actually the first person ever to sit in the seat. So it was warmed up uh, starting with him, who was our volunteer. We are going to stop this recording and open it up for Hacker Happy Hour and Q&A open discussion. So feel free to come back on screen and open your mics and whatever. It will not be recorded.